Hallo iedereen, fijn dat jullie er vanavond zijn. Hallo iedereen, fijn dat jullie er vanavond zijn. Welkom bij de allereerste uitzending van Dendrobatia Nederland, de vereniging voor gifkikkerspecialisten. Ik ben Sander Bauer, de secretaris van de vereniging en jullie gastheer tijdens deze livestream. Wij luisteren vanavond naar herpetoloog Cesar Barrio Amoros. Hij is bekend van zijn onderzoek naar reptielen en amfibieën en vertelt ons zo dadelijk over de Atelopus varius in Costa Rica en Panama. Is een paar korte mededelingen. Deze livecast wordt opgenomen, dus u kunt de uitzending later nog terugkijken en delen via de YouTube-link. Cesar presenteert straks in het Engels en we worden live voorzien van Nederlandse ondertiteling. Vragen kun je stellen in de live chat en deze behandel ik later in de uitzending. En af en toe kunnen er wat haperingen zijn want deze livecast komt rechtstreeks vanuit de jungle in Costa Rica. We gaan nu over naar het Engels, naar Cesar. Cesar, we know yes. you for quite some years already. Um, you have worked with many NGOs and shown extensive track record of more than a decade of wildlife research. I believe you were also involved with the rediscovery of the starry night toad, Atelopus. Ariescu, which appeared in National Geographic last year. Now, last time we spoke, you contacted us for an expedition into uncharted territory and support for your research into Atelopus varius, leading to an unexpected discovery. I'm sure you'll tell us all about that during this episode, so please take us to your presentation. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, yeah, uh, today I'm going to explain uh, about some of my results and some anecdotes also about the research of Atelopus varius in Costa Rica. But the curious fact about that is that this uh, study or interest of Atelopus varius doesn't start in Costa Rica. It started in Venezuela in 1995 because I am from Barcelona, Spain. So I went to Venezuela just as a young anthropologist. I'm not biologist, I am an anthropologist. So I went there and uh, looking for so many different species of herbs in that area, uh, willing to discover new species and discover new facts about herpetofauna in general. So when I arrived in 1995 uh, to Venezuela, I moved immediately to the Andes. These are the northern part of the Andes. Uh, which die here in Venezuela, and in the middle there is a beautiful town called Merida. So this uh, Venezuela in general is uh, home of nine species of Atelopus, uh, of which two are here in the coastal range, and seven are microendemic from different areas of the Andes of Venezuela. So my main target there was to find every and each of them, which was, uh, I will tell you later, was not possible. But uh, this was my will when I arrived to Venezuela. So um, in 2003, it was a beautiful uh, news in, Atelopo, in, in National Geographic, sorry, about the rediscovery of this Atelopus cruciger in 2003. It was gone from uh, 1986, was the last report. So I was so excited and I went to the coastal ranch uh, with different researchers to look for it, and we found it. And that's why I, I, I could do this picture of one of the few remnant populations of Atelopus cruciger. But my main interest was in the Andean species, especially Atelopus carborarensis. This species was so appealing to me, so beautiful, so interesting. It's a big species, especially females are really uh, reaching four or five centimeters, and uh, the tales that people uh, tell me about this animal were so interesting, so unbelievable, that, for example, uh, in the meantime of their, its discovery by Juan Rivero, uh, he dis described it in 1972 or something like that, but during the 70s and the first 80s, this animal is a microendemic from a very small area, like 30, 40 square kilometers, but in that area it was so abundant that in the time when they uh, went to the creeks for reproduction, they covered 
the forest floor and they cross roads, dirt roads, and some people, some uh, peasants living there, they told me that these parts of the dirt roads were yellow, completely yellow by a few vehicles passing and killing hundreds uh, in, in one time. So, of course, it was impossible to me to believe that this species was gone suddenly, while before, just the previous years, was so abundant. So I started this uh, Telopus project in Venezuela with this uh, species as a target. And uh, I was a co-founder of an NGO called uh, Fundación Andígena in Venezuela, in the, in the Andes of Venezuela. We had different projects, but this was my project. And I spent 10 years just there looking for this species, uh, talking with uh, peasants, with uh, uh, school uh, people at the school, so kids, doing lectures, uh, making interviews to everybody in the area. And in 10 years, I couldn't see a single one. This was really disappointing to me. But also there is some rumors that tell that it's still there. So sadly, I'm not in Venezuela anymore, so I cannot continue this project. But as a part of the project, we produce this beautiful poster. And uh, this was distributed uh, to different areas, especially in the towns around the distribution range of the species, uh, to shops, uh, supermarkets, to schools, uh, any, anyone that wanted this poster, it was free to, to give. And thank you to this poster, which I gave to uh, one of my friends was was not living in that area, in another area of the Andes. This friend called me and said, hey, I have this uh, yellow frog for you. And it was, how is that? Because you don't live in the, in the area of this uh, species, of Atelopus canorensis. Okay, I have a yellow frog here that one of my workers gave me. So I went immediately there and we had this in my hands at the Lopus mucubagiensis, the last of its kind. It was a female full of eggs and uh, this was the last specimen. Look at that. Interestingly, uh, it, it was completely red uh, uh, in the belly, a beautiful animal. But look, these scars or this uh, skin tegument was not right here, okay? So, of course, I, I tried to manage to, to have it for a while, alive, but eventually it died. And, of course, it was positive for BD. So later I will talk better about uh, the BD, the fungus problem. But this animal for me was really, okay, there's still some animals in the Andes of Venezuela. Probably this was the last one, and there is no other sites more recently. So, due to the political, economical situation in Venezuela, I decided to move in 2011, and I had some friends in Costa Rica. I came here to just to see if I like the country, and I love it. So I started, uh, I moved here to this area. Uh, here, the starting location is my home. It's in the between the mountains, the Talamanca Mountains, and the sea, the Pacific uh, Ocean. So I live in the middle of the rainforest right now, and this is really a beautiful spot. And close around here, it was news about the presence of Atelopus varius. So of course, I started to investigate about possible uh, surviving localities for or populations of this species. But in Costa Rica, there are four species of Atelopus. The first one is Atelopus senex, which is uh, actually um, is endemic from this area, the central volcano area. This is our several volcanoes, the highest volcanoes in Costa Rica. So Atelopus senex was endemic from that area, very variable species. And the last site was in 1986. So from now, from then, there's no other sites. Then we have Atelopus chiriquiensis, which is also another polychromatic species, which is endemic of the Talamanca Ranch, which is this area shared with Panama. So this is the part of Costa Rica and some parts here in Panama. 
was the distribution ranch of Atelopus chiriquiensis. The last site was in 1996. And sadly, right now, the only possible possibility to see Atelopus chiriquiensis and Senex is just in these jars in the UCR, in the Universidad de Costa Rica uh, Museum. And then we have another species, Atelopus chiripoensis which is a mystery species. There's a lot of uh, dilemma or a lot of discussion about the validity of this species. Right story is that uh, this was des described recently in 2009, but it was uh, collected theoretically in 1980. But the botanist in the highest part of Costa Rica, in the paramos running the Chiripo mountain, the Chiripo is the highest peak in Costa Rica, is 3,800 meters. So in the surrounding paramo, this botanist said that he saw hundreds of them in reproduction and just collected one. So this animal was in the collection of the Universidad de Costa Rica for a long time. I think it arrived to Jay Savage and he was reluctant to describe it because it was very strange looking. It looks exactly like one of the locus of the Ignescence group, which is in Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. So what is this ignescence looking animal in Costa Rica? It's very strange. And apparently this botanist, which is dead, so it's not possible to ask him anymore, uh, he was in some Andean countries also collecting plants before. So maybe this species is just a mistake and is not valid, and it's just a synonym of some Andean species. But this is a mystery to resolve. And it's not the main interest of this lecture. So let's proceed. Then we have Atelopus varius. So Atelopus varius, as the name indicates, is very variable. So we have here this uh, morph is the one from Monteverde. Monteverde, maybe you can uh, know the name because Monteverde is also the place, the last locality, the only and last locality of Incilius. Periglenes, the famous golden toad that was also extinct in the 80s, in 87, if I don't remember mal. So here also within Cilius Periglenes, in the same area was this morph of Atelopus varius, very beautiful. And also it was researched by um, several researchers there. So we know a lot of about natural history of Atelopus varius, thanks to these populations of Monteverde. Later, we will talk more about that. Then we have several other morphs in Panama. In Panama, there is many, many morphs, some of them surviving today. Here we have also a poster made by the Panamanians' uh, colleagues about the Telopus varios. You see how different it can be. But, of course, this is uh, probably a complex of species. So this is a lot of more research, taxonomic research to do. Again, in Monteverde, there's a photo of Marty Crump. She was a student of Jay Savage, and she was working in uh, Monteverde for a long time with he, her student, uh, Alan Pounds. So they, in the 80s, they were uh, monitoring Incilius periglenes and Atelopus varius. So we have a lot of information, very valid information about the natural history of this species, thanks to Marty Crump. Alan Pounds, but this population is completely gone. From 1987, it's gone. Here we have the map published by Jay Savage in his uh, Bible of the Repetofauna of Costa Rica, this beautiful book. And uh, in the map of Atelopus varius, we see that this is, seems like a very widespread species. We have this uh, northern locality in an uh, isolated volcano. Also, there is some other localities not in this map here too. This is Monteverde. And you see that there are Atelopus varios in the Caribbean. This is the Caribbean uh, side, the Atlantic side of Costa Rica. This is the Pacific side. So we see that some are in the Caribbean side, some are in the Pacific side. And some arrive from zero meters to 2,000 meters. That's the altitudinal branch of Atelopus varius. But some, uh, suddenly, in 1987, they disappeared. 
not that they disappeared, but you know, researchers started to report that hey, I don't see Atelopus varius anymore anywhere in Costa Rica. This is the map uh, produced by the UCN, so mostly the same, but in a different way. So from northern Costa Rica, not reaching uh, Nicaragua, but all this way, Pacific side of the volcanoes, uh, of the northern volcanoes, going southwards, eastwards, okay, through Panama, and the Pacific uh, side, and in the Caribbean side. And then, in 2003, a friend of mine, Justin Jigger, by chance, makes a picture of Atelopus in a private reserve in, in the middle of the central Pacific of Costa Rica. And of course, this was quite uh, news. So many other researchers like Mason Ryan, Ron Gagliardo and others, uh, and Juan Lenders arrived to that spot and they saw a population, the only uh, remaining population of Atelopus varius, until 2007, when uh, Tuan Lenders went the last time and saw it. And from 2007, no one could reach this population anymore because the owners of the reserve are so uh, close to that. So I tried many times, I asked permission many times, and I always had no response. So they are not interested maybe, or I don't know exactly what's going on there, but from 2007, we don't have any more news about this population in uh, the Central Pacific of Costa Rica. But then in 2008, a group of uh, mammalogists, people in uh, making research about mammals, they found uh, some Atelopus varius in another area uh, close to the Panamanian border, also in the Pacific side. They found this population. Uh, this was Jose Gonzalez Maya and collaborators. And in 2013, they published the preliminary results. And we'll talk uh, about more about that later. So this uh, population, I call it B, B1, because uh, I have uh, a nomenclature for each population. So this is B1. This is uh, close to San Vito. San Vito is a town close to the Panamanian border. And this population has been surveyed by Gomez Hoyos and uh, González Maya since then. And they reported until now of uh, 222 individuals. But talking with uh, Diego Gomez, uh, they, he, he told me that there's more than 600. But this, uh, these uh, numbers and these uh, results are in progress. So we have a quite healthy population in the southern version of the Pacific at 1,300 meters high altitude. And in, two, in the same year, 2013, both Oviedo, another researcher, just found another animal in uh, another spot, maybe 40 kilometers west of, of, of the previous one. And he made a, a internet publication. I went that, to that area and I found the population, and I found one special, one individual only. Uh, this, this is the animal. But it was just a few hours uh, search. Then in 2015, talking, because I was talking all the time with uh, peasants, with uh, local people of several areas, close to my place, close where I live, uh, people know the animal. The people living in the country, in the country here means rainforest, basically, with some small uh, cattle, uh, ranches, and maybe some crops, survival ones, so not, not extensive. So there's uh, a 90% of rainforest there, and it's very steep with a lot of small rivers and creeks. So in that area, everybody I talk with more than 40 years, they know the species, and they recognize that when they were kids, like uh, when they, they were like, seven to 10 years old, they play with it. They, they love to, to find them in amplexus and, and they play like uh, they were uh, figures and, and playing football or whatever. So, and it was so abundant that they never care about it. So it was a beautiful frog living in, in those creeks. And they started to realize, oh yes, but probably I didn't see them in more than 30 years. 
So now they are realizing that they are not anymore. So uh, talking with many people, one of them told me, oh yes, I, I, I found uh, a few several days ago. What? What's that? So can you bring me there? Yes. So I, I, I went with this guy and just walking this uh, beautiful creek, just maybe 10 meters, I found that. So this was my first atelopus uh, of this population in that area. So it was, wow. So this is a beautiful, beautiful population. And I was surviving it for several years. And then I made this preliminary uh, publication with uh, Juana Barca in 2016 uh, with data on, on the only first uh, visit in which I saw only nine living individuals and one dead individual. So uh, I swap a healthy one and tested negative to BD, to the fungus. Here we can see some different uh, patterns. You know, Telopus varius is variable, as you know, but each individual is completely different from each other. So it's very easy to differentiate between them. And we, you see black animals with yellow. We see yellow animals with black. And in a few cases, we have some red spots. If you remember the pictures of the other population, it was completely different. It was black dorsally with red or orange spots and just yellow on the limbs and on the belly. Completely different, very recognizable morphs. And I found that, a dead specimen. So of course I collected that and it tested positive for BD. And in the next uh, visit with Juana Barca, we found another one that was sick, that was dying and was really very skinny and had a lot of um, skin uh, bounds. We collected that and also, and it was totally positive for BD. So the BD is there, but it's not affecting the healthy animals anymore. So this population, to have an idea, is at 400 to 500 meters. So it's, it's like a lowland, it's a lowland population compared with the other populations that are always above uh, 1,000 meters. So what is this fungus? What is this BD I'm talking about? This is a, a pathogenic fungus that is not natural from America, theoretically. So there is a lot of uh, discussion about the origin of BD. Of course, there is some people be believing that it's a cosmopolitan organism, which is probably it is. Uh, some people say that it's from Africa, some others from America, some more others from Asia. Doesn't matter right now. It's not the, the mission of my lecture to discuss about that. It's just how this uh, organism, this fungus, affects amphibians. And is that this, uh, so the spores of the fungus live in the water, and then when uh, these amphibians are going to the water, you know, Atelopus is a terrestrial species or animal, but of course, when they are in a plexus and they, want, well, they go to the water to spawn and the male is attached to the female, of course, in that moment, they are in the water, the spores can go into the uh, skin of the of all amphibians. So the spores burrow into the skin and they develop there. And when they are mature, the sporangium release spores after a few days. And this affects the skin, this, the osmosis. The, uh, they use the skin to, to breathe, to have this uh, contact with air and they actually die suffocated. That's how these animals die. So uh, there is uh, this researcher, Karen Lips, which uh, was uh, very concerned about the movement or the apparent movement of this uh, BD because she was uh, working here in this area, in this area of Costa Rica, and then in this area of Panama, in this area. Okay, in the Talamanca mountains. So she came after knowing that in 1987, this is Monteverde here, in Monteverde in 1987, all most amphibians disappeared, especially in Silius periglenes and Atelopus varius. She was here in that area and previous to 1993, like 1992, the amphibian community 
was perfect, was very, very diverse. It, it wasn't a hot spot for amphibian diversity. She described this beautiful highlight. Uh, it's Moila Calypsa. Uh, also described Crowastor Phasma. In this area was not only Atelopus varius, but also Atelopus chiriquiensis, Incilius fastidiosus. So many different species that in 1993, they were gone. So she, because it, it was no more, more, more to do here because there were no amphibians, she moved to La Fortuna and she saw that before 1996, like 1995, 1994, the community of amphibians was perfect, another hotspot full of species. 1996, boom, something happened, suddenly all these disappear. But it's not like that. She found dying animals, she found dead animals. So something happened there. And then she moved to El Copé, also in central Panama, and she saw the same. 2001, full of animals, full of amphibians, community great. 2002, suddenly they disappear. So she predicted that in 2004, the wave, this wave of BD should arrive to central Panama in 2006, will reach eastern Panama. And she was right. And this was very disturbing and very worrying. So this, how is it looks uh, a sick Atelopus, in this case, Atelopus seteki. It's dying. It, 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 it is a, a long and painful uh, death because it just uh, can uh, breathe well. And it is Atelopus limosus death by BD. So to now, uh, we can make uh, like a uh, recess and if you guys you have uh, we are at the mid uh, time of this uh, lecture this presentation so if you have any questions at the time maybe i can respond or i can continue to let me know i say so yeah we'll do a brief round of questions uh, thank you for the first part of your presentation for those of you just joining us we are listening to herpetologist Cesar Barrio Amoros, and he's telling us about his recent expeditions and research into the Atelopus amphibians of Venezuela. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience, so let's see what we can answer for you tonight. I can see someone asking if, yes, there will be a recording of this presentation, uh, and we will try to also fix the subtitles later. Uh, first question is from Julian. Uh, considering the regional circumstances for the Atlopus ferius, would it be able to sustain its life cycle in Suriname? Cesar, what well, is Suriname? Not in Suriname, so uh, you know that every species of Atlopus have a different range. So in Suriname you have Atlopus bukmuidi, uh, and this is a completely different species. So. So I don't know, I'm not sure if you are asking if it's possible to keep Atelopus varius in Suriname or something like that, or I'm not sure, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't suggest that. So if we can do something about Atelopus varius, should be just here in Costa Rica. Okay. Uh, a second question is regarding the BD fungus uh, from Donny. He asks if it's a zoonotical disease, so if it can be transferred uh, from humans to animals as an intermediary host can we play a role well uh, until now uh, no there's uh, no record of that just uh, possibly uh, because it lives in the water it can travel this bd this fungus can travel in aquatic uh, birds for example and it can be spread around um, to new areas uh, aquatic areas but it's not known that this can be aff affect other animals, from amphibians to other animals, even if, if uh, other animal like a snake or something eat a frog with BD. I don't think it's, it's zoonotic right now. Okay, okay. I have a question for you, then we'll get back to the questions from the audience. Um, this is a big question. So you, you mentioned... Uh, that an entire population, which was uh, first very well present, suddenly collapsed. Uh, and I had to immediately think of the Christmas Island red crabs. Uh, so it's not uncommon for a quite abundant species to suddenly disappear. And 
what role do you think we as a society have to play in this? Well, this is still a mystery. Why suddenly, it, because it was not only in Costa Rica, this uh, during the 80s, as you saw, it was, well, the study was made in Costa Rica and in Panama, but suddenly it happened everywhere, mostly in, in Latin America, in the Andes, was also in the 80s, in Venezuela, in Colombia, in Ecuador. Um, this probably was a pandemic. Maybe this, uh, this BD, this fungus arrived from other place uh, in some way, we don't know exactly how, uh, maybe even with uh, migratory birds. And then uh, it was a pandemic. It's a pandemic affecting the most sensitive amphibians, not all amphibians, because many amphibians survive with any problem. Even now, most amphibians are uh, asymptomatic, but they have the BD in their skin. But in this case, Atelopus, all the genus Atelopus, which is like 95 species, is so sensitive that it suffered a lot. So just Atelopus and a few other uh, genera, but not all amphibians. So what we had as, a, as humans to do with that, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. Okay. Well, I think one of the things we can do is keep up to date uh, on the... Uh, BD research. I can see also some questions. Uh, one from David. Uh, he asks if there might be a chance the Incilius perigenes is still present in Monteverde. Well, that's another matter, a complete different matter. And I would say yes, why not? But the problem with these micro endemics is that they're, because in their habitat is completely pristine, still pristine. So it's completely protected, and actually there is a long time without uh, not allowing anybody, except some researchers, to go to the area to look for it. No luck until now, but why not? Uh, you know that uh, buffonids have long lives for, for such a small animals. They can live even 20 years. Why not they are surviving under uh, land, in, in the roots, in, in so invisible for us, and sometime they explode again? I hope so. but. Uh, it's not, it's not my research subject, so I cannot tell. I wish. <laughs> so all we can do is remain very hopeful. Uh, one more question regarding the fungus. Uh, 195 Mari asks if the fungus can also attack tadpoles and if tadpoles can survive an infection. That's a good question. Uh, yes, uh, the fungus attack the ker keratin parts of the mouth, and they actually, uh, when uh, Karen Leaves was collecting some tadpoles of uh, Atelopus and other animals uh, and other species there, she saw that they were missing the keratin of the mouth. And of course, with that they cannot uh, eat. And Atelopus, uh, uh, later I will show you a tadpole picture, and you will see it has a very special form and is adapted to fast currents. So, with that keratin in uh, in the mouth, they cannot eat and they cannot attach to the rocks. So they die, of course they die. So yes, uh, fungus can attack tadpoles as well as adults. Okay, I'm looking for a picture in our book, Gif Kickers, right now to uh, make it visionary, but we only have like five more minutes. So I'll ask one question by myself. You mentioned you uh, lack... Uh, uh, entrance to a population in a private reserve um, since 2007. Uh, do you think this population has still survived? I hope so. I really hope so. I don't have a clue. So I think the last time uh, Tuan Lenders uh, went there, it was a few years ago, but uh, he had bad luck. It started to rain a lot, he told me, and he couldn't go to, to reach the place. It's a long, long way. A uh, long walk, like maybe three, four hours to reach the place. It was really this uh, tropical rainstorm, so he didn't reach. So we don't know. So the last time, it's 2007, and really I'm eager to go, but I need the permit of these uh, persons to go. I cannot enter a private reserve by myself, maybe with a commando mission or something, with an <laughs> helicopter. I don't know. I don't have the money yet. <laughs> we will have to uh, gather some funds for that one first. Uh, yeah. Maybe we can help you with it later on. Um, 
I can see times running out quite quickly. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid we really only had a brief time frame for your questions. Uh, if you have any topics that remained unaddressed, please visit our forum at gifkickerportaal.nl and we will try to provide you with more answers. Uh, for now, Caesar, please continue with your presentation. Okay, going on. So, uh, we started to, we know, me. <laughs> the problem also in this uh, new location, this new population, is that I had exactly the same trouble like in this other reserve. Uh, the owner is very private, the, uh, he doesn't like any visitors. So, I had a long time trying to convince him how important was that. And he finally uh, acceded to allow me, only me, with a, a, a worker of his, going with me all the time, you know, and uh, I lastly arrived to the area, so with permission, and I started to work uh, during many years with this population. So one of the things I started to do is to swap specimens. So why we swap is because we are looking for the presence of this fungus, so we need to do this very, very carefully, of course, we never touch these animals directly with our hands. We use, we use gloves, or in this case, a, a plastic bag. And then uh, we preserve these swaps in, 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 a, in a cooler, okay? And then we need to send this to the lab. The problem also was the, I had the permits, I, uh, the permits to work with this population, but in the last, uh, this, the first year I, I could swap uh, some specimens, but the last year I couldn't have the permit to swap. So this is really a, a big loss of opportunity to know what's going on. But it's, it's true. Uh, the problem is that all to, to all these swaps to be processed, to make the PCRs in the lab, it costs a lot of money. So I couldn't have these funds just for the lab, only for the field. So in this case, I just uh, continue doing the census. The census was the most important thing to know how many of these animals are and how good and healthy they are, but not uh, knowing if they, are, uh, if they have this BD still. So, when I, uh, I will share some of the pre preliminary results. Right now, you must know, uh, we are finishing a very interesting, I hope, uh, paper uh, with all these results and many others about the current status of Atelopus varios in Costa Rica. Okay, so uh, including all this monitoring funded by uh, several NGOs. So uh, when I arrived to the creek, uh, the total transect uh, where the Atelopus is present is like 780 meters. Of course, the creek is much longer, but downstream, no Atelopus, and upstream is very difficult to reach. So I don't, I'm not sure still if there are some of them or not, but in this 700 meters, I made uh, four sectors. I sectorized the, the creek by waterfalls. So from waterfall one to waterfall two, uh, from two to three, like that, because it was easier like that to know which sector is more important for them, uh, which sector they use more for reproduction or if they move, etc. So. Of course, each uh, specimen I saw, I take dorsal pictures and ventral pictures to identify them. Because, uh, as I, I told before, any specimen is different. So it has a different pattern. There is no one exactly alike each uh, other. So it was easy for me to make uh, like a nomenclature for each one, a uh, number for each one, and to know if I uh, had uh, encounters with them. In each field party, I, the mean of observation was of 13 individuals with a minimum of five in the wet season and in the maximum 18. Some of the, these field parties were two days, some of, some of them were one day, uh, so it was not uh, possible to do it totally precisely like uh, the same each time, no. Be because of many, many different reasons, but uh, we saw a total males and females of 79, but just the adult females, which you can distinguish very well because of the size, 
were only 15, okay, with 27 juveniles and seven metamorphs, in a total of 113 and seven recaptures. We saw only two on plexus. One is the was the cover of the presentation close to the waterfall, and this it was this was in sector three, and this was in sector two. So this was a, a more plain sector, and the other was more steep with waterfalls. Two on plexus. I saw another couple, uh, uh, like a male and female, less than one meter aside, and I I waited like three hours just uh, ready with my tripod and my camera trying to see if they started on amplexus but they didn't uh, the male was eating and the female was completely not moving so i couldn't find x i couldn't find any tadpoles or males calling and i don't know why because i i think i uh, we had a quite a long time uh, working there and we saw this, this was very uh, surprising and shocking, you know, to see this half antelopus, a female, a vigorous female, and this attempt of predation, I think, I can only think of one or two predators that can do something like that, and should be crabs, there's two kinds of crabs, shrimps, shrimps really huge, like small lobsters, or big crabs that of course can cut it easily, but then, of course, you know, these atelopus are toxic. So maybe they try to eat and say, oh, this is not pleasant for me. So they discard the rest of the animal. So to have an idea, this is the topography of the creek. So we have here a, a map of the population, the population A, based on these 130 sites between 2015 and 2019, but uh, some of these points have more, can have more than one uh, animal. So sometimes I found even, I remember 10 animals in, in less than 10 meters. So yeah, it is uh, more or less the distribution of the animals in all the time. Okay, this is what's regarding the population A, the, the one close to my place. So, uh, remember the, the rediscovery of the Boza Oviedo uh, population. I went and I found one animal. So I went again, and in three times uh, that I went, I found three individuals. So it was like, wow, it has a very low density, or I am failing, because the, the dry season uh, is the proper season to go and make research. First, because it's not raining, Second, because the, the creek or the river is very low and it's easier to walk. Otherwise, in the wet season, is the, the water level can rise uh, very suddenly and it's very slippery and it's, it's dangerous actually to walk in these rivers in the wet season. So we use the, mostly the dry season to make the censuses. But in this case, three times in the dry season, and I saw only three individuals to me, it was very, very low density, but in May 2019, in two days, one night, with four, five more persons, we saw 14 individuals. This is the place where I uh, brought uh, Remco, who uh, came with me, and uh, we saw, I don't know, two or three uh, individuals at that time. And I really would like to increase the effort in that area. At night, uh, the lopus varius are found like this. So they are just sleeping, quite exposed in leaves, very close to the creek, sometimes over the creek. And I think they are not a threat of uh, nocturnal predators like snakes or something, because they are quite uh, toxic. So this is the map of the population. This, this population I told you, B2 is the population. And in this case, there is something quite worrying because this line here, this line I'm tracing right now, is the 2,000 meters line. Here we are at 1,100 meters, and here we are at 100, 500 meters, something like that. So it's quite steep, but you see that the agriculture border is growing. 
theoretically, this road it's, uh, is separating the forest from the crops here. These are, this is pineapple. And pineapple is using a lot of chemicals. So this area is totally illegal, illegal but still there. And they are using chemicals. And look how close an Atelopus is here or here. So this is one of the creeks. And this animal was uh, in a very small uh, fountain, okay, but very close to the uh, pineapple crop. So this is really worrying, really worrying. And uh, I, I talk with some people that is interested to buy some lands to prevent this pineapple frontier to expand. This is a really endangered population. So I talked about the population A for the morph A, the morph B, and now this is the morph C. So there's a different morph, different coloration, uh, which is more uh, profuse with uh, dots, red and yellow dots. And for me, it's the most beautiful of them. So this in C1, population C1, it was uh, discovered a few years ago, and it uh, had already a monitory, monitoring by the Universidad de Costa Rica, UCR, and the York University in Canada. And it was published by Jimenez et al. Uh, last year. So they found 25 individuals in this population. I went only once just to visit the area, and I found this specimen, only one. Beautiful, really beautiful animal. I think they have planned to continue the monitoring, but this year has been impossible, of course. And by chance, I, I, I want to, to tell how important is that uh, in, involve people. So uh, Costa Rica, fortunately, we have a lot of young uh, naturalists, a lot of young interested uh, bird watchers, naturalists, wildlife guides. They are really interested and they know a little bit about everything and they can uh, recognize such a species like Atelopus. So I had this call like, hey, uh, they send me a picture. Look look what I found. Wow, what's that? This is Atelopus. Where was that? So I went with this guy. This was in May, actually, May this year, to this new population. This is called C2. And then we discovered another new, completely new population. In three times, uh, we saw seven individuals. Uh, plus three recaptures, so 10 sites. In this, uh, this was in May. I, I came by, uh, I went in August and I couldn't find anyone. And then this is the population C3. This population, uh, this was, this came also with another call by a friend in, the, in, in an area where they, they say, hey, I saw some people show me a picture of what I believe is a telopus. So he, they sent to me and I said, oh yes, this is, this was the, 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 the pictures took by these guys and we made this, um, this expedition and this is when I asked for some more support because it was out of my program, my, my monitoring program had the, their own costs and this was like, hey, I need to go there because this is a new population. This was last year uh, in May, I, I remember in May. And this is when uh, the Swedish Dendrobatid Society came along with uh, thanks to Tobias. And uh, I received some funds to go to this area because this area was so remote and so difficult to reach that uh, it was like one day long journey on horse just to reach the place. Uh, I, I went uh, one day, one night and another half a day and then when we, we went back a uh, half day on a horse again. It was long, exhausting, but I couldn't find any. But we have the information that they are, and it's the same population, the same morph C. Okay, so I need to go again, but wow, it's, it's a long expedition. I need an helicopter, maybe <laughs> I will ask for funds for that. So this is the map we generated. This is going to be uh, published uh, soon enough, probably the beginning of next year, in this uh, paper we are making. Uh, the map was generated by uh, Gerardo Chavez at the Universidad de Costa Rica. And as if you remember the previous map from Savage, this was in 2002, 
now we have much more information. Of course, we have this in the north, but we have uh, these th this, uh, black dots are historical distribution. So they are not extant. Or we need to go again and see. There's not many people going to these remote areas. And the red ones are the extant localities. So the ones I'm talking today about. So this is Morpho A or population A or A, which is the one is close to my place. And this is the one uh, focus of my monitoring that you see is uh, black with yellow or yellow with black. And then we have the population B with the uh, population monitoring uh, monitored by Gonzalez Maya and collaborators and Diego uh, Gomez Hoyos and collaborators in this area. Okay. And this is the B2, the one I told you I, I went, but it was in low density. So look at the morph. The morph is completely black on the back with red, few red spots and yellow only on the limbs and on the belly. And then there is the, the morph C. C, and uh, this is the population monitored by Jimenez et al. This is the new population we visited this year. And this is the remote population uh, I went in on horse. Okay, these all are pertain to the morph C, the most colorful one. And B, this is the first one, the, the private reserve where I don't have access. And uh, by pictures, looks similar to morph C, but maybe it has some, some particularities. So this is mainly what uh, we did. And now we have some recommendations, of course, uh, which would be to establish a major conservation management plan with all actors implicated in Atelopus or amphibian research in Costa Rica and interested parties, of course. Uh, we need to establish a long-term monitoring and population biology study of all known populations. But of course, for that, we need funds, but also we need personnel. It's not only funds. We need people trained to go there because I cannot really be, I have a life. <laughs> so I cannot go everywhere uh, every time. And we need to uh, study the possibility to establish an ex situ program in Costa Rica. If you see, there is uh, successful ex situ programs in Panama, in Honduras, in Colombia, in uh, Ecuador, of course, but not in Costa Rica. It's curious. And then uh, I want to thank, uh, thank you, gracias. Uh, you correct me if I, I, I'm wrong, but I think this is in Dutch. Thank you and tag in Swedish. Uh, I need to thank especially the Dendrobatid Netherlands uh, for funding me in this uh, project and also to the Swedish Dendrobatid Society for this exploration of this remote area and to the Philadelphia Zoo, which also uh, donated me some equipment. But before I finish, I like to also share with you some other sites of uh, different Atelopus species in different countries. These are very recent, uh, mostly from last year. Last year in March, uh, we went to Panama and totally unexpectedly, we were at night in a, in a, in a creek and we saw uh, several individuals of Atelopus varius sleeping. Of course, we went the next day and we saw uh, several more uh, active during the day, including a young one. This was really unexpected and very exciting. This is Atelopus varius in Panama. Then we went to the Darien, also in Panama. The Darien is this area close to Colombia and is the only gap existing of, uh, between Central or and North America and South America. So there is no road going through, and this is a very swampy and mountainous area. It's a very distant and difficult area to reach, and it's uh, home of three species of Atelopus, probably four. There's one uh, new species probably to be described. So we went to the Darien to see this Atelopus glyphus, and we saw one individual in one place, and then we went to the northeast area of uh, Panama to see Atelopus limosus, and we saw also one individual alive. And what we believe is another individual dead. This was uh, collected also, and this is going to be studied in Panama. And then in Ecuador, uh, also last year, in July and August, uh, I saw many of these Atelopus spumarius complex. 
during the day are really uh, cryptic because they are in the moss and they are difficult to see. And during the night, uh, this is the Atelopus, uh, which is called right now Wampukrum, is not described, it's a new species to be described, probably by Luis Coloma and collaborators, uh, but it's quite a posematic at night. But during the day, if they are not moving in moss, they are quite uh, mimetic, like this. This is a totally mimetic species. And this animal is from the Zamora uh, province. It's uh, something related to Atelopus palmatus, probably is a new species. And this is, was quite abundant. And at night, uh, they, they sleep on the tip of, of leaves. And very funny to see several individuals uh, going at, uh, at evening, going to, to sleep. And in that population also is the only place where I saw some tadpoles. So tadpoles of Atelopus are really very particular. They have very short tails. They're painted. Uh, they're very beautiful tadpoles. And they have a very big head and body. And they have this uh, bu uh, big mouth with uh, a lot of keratin. And they can stuck to the rocks in the fast current. So they can move like, uh, like this kind of... Um, uh, lorry carried fish that, that, that can move through the through the rocks. So it was so exciting to see. At the Lopus longirostris, just to, as an example, so in Ecuador and Colombia, they are uh, rediscovering different species that were thought to be extinct. In 2016, uh, some um, colleagues they did rediscover at the Lopus longirostris in the western part of at the Lopus, and now is part of the Centro Hambatu project they are keeping them there and they are reproducing them which is which is really really interesting and the most exciting thing for me was uh, last year in august to rediscover this atelopus mindoensis species that was uh, completely gone for 30 years so it was not seen and mindo is one of the most visited areas for herping in in ecuador we saw this animal we went uh, the next day with some friends from Tropical Herping, we, we found another uh, young and they still going there and finding some individuals, which we already published, the, the, the rediscovery of the Arlenkin toad, Atelopus minduensis, in Ecuador. Uh, this was published in April this year. So very, very recent. And now, yes, I can say thank you very much. And I don't know if you have some more questions. Thank you, Cesar, for this presentation. Um, I certainly learned a lot of things. Uh, I see one more question I will answer briefly in a minute. Um, so you mentioned also a concentrated conservation effort is necessary to protect against pineapple invasions. That's new to me. So uh, let's focus on that. And also let's get you that helicopter uh, real soon for your next expeditions. Uh, you mentioned uh, Gitrit a number of times, and swapping is indeed one of the most important things that we as an association can do. So from then about in Nederland, we also have these swap sets, which you can get for free if you are a member, and so, so you can help us in this research. Um, yeah, stay safe in these crazy times, of course. There's one more question uh, regarding... Uh, from JR, are there plans to sequence the Venezuelan species of Atalopus? What do you know about that, Cesar? The Venezuelan ones, wow. So, to sequence, uh, they, they, they mean in, in genetically or what? Yes, I think so. Well, uh, the problem right now with uh, many extinct or pretendedly extinct species is that they can be in, in, uh, in jars of alcohol, but if they were preserved, in formalin, uh, probably it's going to be difficult to sequence them. They are, they are trying, of course. There are some teams at different universities trying to do it. Um, I don't know exactly about Venezuelan species right now, but would be absolutely interesting. I think Stefan Lotters is, is, is leading some important effort about uh, genetic uh, work with Atelopus, but uh, I'm not involved, so I, I cannot uh, tell more about that. Okay, so that is something we might be able to answer via our forum. Um, Cesar, thank you very much. I will close off in Dutch, so you won't be understanding me at all anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Ik ga naar het Nederlands. 
Uh, voor iedereen die vanaf thuis meekijkt, bedankt voor jullie aanwezigheid. Wil jullie meer weten over het onderzoek van Cesar? Kijk dan op zijn ResearchGate of ga naar zijn website crwild.com. De links plaatsen wij hier nog in de beschrijving onder. Wil je graag een donatie achterlaten voor het werk van Cesar of lid worden van Dendobati naar Nederland? Ga dan naar onze eigen website gifkikkerportaal.nl. Je kunt dus ook terecht op het forum als je nog geen antwoord hebt gekregen op je vragen. Dit was het voor onze eerste aflevering. Laat even een bericht achter in de comments en gooi dat duimpje omhoog. Wil je op de hoogte blijven van aankomende video's? Abonneer je dan op ons kanaal. En voor nu een fijn weekend en tot een volgende keer. Tot ziens iedereen. Thank you.